the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Welcome everyone, and if you've got your Bibles, I want you to stand with me, and let's pray, and let's get into the Word. We're going to be in the book of Luke tonight, looking at angels and what they said. What does that have to do with us in the 21st century? Because God's Word is relevant for today. It is the book that we can live by. It is the book that we can order our lives by. It's the book that changes us. There's power in the Word of God. And so tonight as we open that book, I believe that God wants to open our hearts. And so, Father, we present ourselves to you as your people. We are privileged to be in a nation that allows us to gather unhindered. And, Father, thank you for the opportunity to be a family tonight and to Sit around the word of God as the Holy Spirit, the teacher, the revelator of the church, teaches us the things that you want us to hear tonight. Lord, this is the Christmas season. We are looking into the amazing nativity and the birth of your son, our Savior. We pray tonight, Lord, that there would be fresh revelation. There would be a wonderful meal that you've prepared. And, Lord, that it would nourish and feed the hearts of your people so that they could leave here and be strengthened, encouraged, edified, and changed by the word of God. So, Lord, we thank you now in the mighty name of Jesus, our King, and all the saints of God said amen. Amen. You've got your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Luke. There's a Christmas card, and you've heard it many times, but I'm going to read it because I like it and I saved it. I received it many years ago. It's certainly nothing new, but I think it has a very, very strong message, and it goes like this. If our greatest need had been information... God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us a financial planner. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a savior. And Christmas is a time when you and I step back and we look into this miracle of the incarnation, the miracle of God stepping out of eternity and stepping into a womb of a virgin, becoming the kinsman redeemer, the savior of the world, all God and all man. In the book of Ruth, there is an entire book that is dedicated to the concept of the kinsman redeemer. That kinsman redeemer was a near blood relative. And God said in the book of the laws, of Israel, that whenever someone would lose an inheritance through wrong choice or calamity, whatever the reason, that there was a way that they could be restored. And that way was through the kinsman or the blood relative. Now, that blood relative had to have three things. That blood relative had to be blood, near of kin. That blood relative had to have the resources to be able to buy back that which had been lost. And that blood relative had to be willing. And on those three accounts, if there was a kinsman redeemer, then whatever was lost, land and wealth, inheritance, that kinsman could come in and purchase it back and restore that one that had fallen. And that was simply a picture because God brings us pictures in life so we can understand him. That kinsman redeemer was a picture of the one that was going to come who would have to be our blood relative, the next of kin, our near of kin. It was a picture of the one that was to come who would have the resources to do what man could not do when he lost himself and gave away his dominion in the fall at the Garden of Eden. This kinsman redeemer had to be blood next of kin, had to have the resources, and the last thing, he had to be willing. He had to want to. And this Christmas, it is such a picture of Jesus Coming into our lives as our near blood relative. He had to be human. That's why it says that he was all God and all man. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. The child is his humanity. The son is his deity. And he had to be all God and all man. And here he comes. And here he is. And tonight we're going to look at this amazing scene. And we're going to look at it through the eyes of the angels and the shepherds that heard what the angels had to say. Because there's so many things we could speak on. We spoke on Simeon and grabbing that baby. And when Simeon picked up a baby, he saw a king in a kingdom. He says, now my eyes have seen your salvation. Tonight we want to look at angels and activity and what they said. And so in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says, now there were in the same country. Now we have just, the verses before have just described Mary having Jesus. 
She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That's verse 7 of chapter 2. Let's go to verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you tidings, good tidings, good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying. So they were singing and speaking. And there was a multitude of the armies of God, a multitude in the skies, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known these sayings which were told them concerning this child, and all those who heard it marveled at all these things which were told them by the shepherds. So tonight we want to look at this shepherd encounter, this angel encounter. And what has this angel encounter got to do with me today? And what can I take from this angel encounter in the 21st century? Because I am a practical woman. I have a very practical life. I live in the real world. I have a family, a large family. Jim and I have lots of real problems just like you. We have to manage budgets just like you have to manage budgets. We have to learn how to get along in every season of our life just like you have to learn to get along in your marriages. You have families that can fight and bicker. We've got families that can fight and bicker. We are no different from you. We have to walk out and flesh out this walk of God just like you do. We're anointed to preach it. We're anointed to oversee your souls because God's called us as shepherds to this church. But we are no more anointed to live this than you are. And I need the practical word of God with things and tools that I can take out and I can put in front of me when I have challenges and I have circumstances in my life. And so the angel speaking the word of God, because the word angel means messenger. And this angel was sent from heaven. And I love that he was sent to the shepherds. And I love that this was the midnight crew. This was the graveyard shift. These were the guys that were dirty and grubby and that they were nobodies of nobodies. And they pulled the hardest shift, the graveyard shift. These were the ones that nobody knew, nobody cared about. They had the dirty job, the low-paying job. Anybody can relate in here to that. And God saw fit and God decided to send his angelic host and his messenger to a group of unclean, dirty, hardworking men that were just on the night watch doing their job. The ordinary, everyday, nothing spectacular, and the spectacular came. And God has a message in that to you and I, that if we, you and I can just do what we're supposed to do and be in the spot we're supposed to be in. Watch and see the extraordinary come into our lives from the kingdom of God. But that's, I want to give you four things tonight, four things to look at. Four things that I believe I can take away with you from this message that the angel and the host of heaven gave these shepherds. So we're going to go fast and we're just going to do four. We're not going to keep you long because you've got a busy day tomorrow. You've got a lot of shopping to do. You've got families coming for Christmas. You've got budgets that you're looking at and thinking, how can I afford to go shopping? How can I get one more gift? Do I have a witness in this house? Some of you, Christmas is the worst time of the year for you. You dread it. You're not looking forward to it. And our goal tonight is to help you turn that around because this is a time when we celebrate and it belongs to us as Christians. Even though it's not the date maybe that Jesus was born and it was the winter solstice and the shortest day of the year and some sun god somewhere in Rome they worshipped. I don't give a royal flip about that. What I care about is every day is redeemable by God and God said choose this day, pick it, celebrate it, step back, look at it, be in awe and actually have a party in your hearts and in your families because for unto you a child is born for unto you a son is given and there is good news in this and the first thing that the angels would tell us tonight is don't be afraid 
This Christmas, don't be afraid. Fear nothing except God. And it's amazing to me how the angels and angel activity, they always have the same thing that comes out of their mouth when they, when they come up against humanity. And that's out of their mouth they say, fear not. Now, have you ever thought about that? Maybe they say that because people are shaking in their boots. We have no idea who these beings are. God says that they're messengers sent to help the saints of God. Spirits, fire, sent out to help us. We know that angels have fed prophets. We know that angels have delivered, message, have delivered messages. We know that angels have saved and rescued those in peril. We know that angel, one angel, one angel killed 180,000 warriors in the book of Isaiah when Hezekiah was coming up against the Rapshenka. One angel wiped out 180,000. So maybe there's a good reason why they say fear not. Because these angels are far stronger than you and I are. They live in the invisible world that we don't see. But they can see us. And they are ministering servants sent to you and to me. And God has assigned angels to you. Now, angels are a company of beings. They are not go cohabiting. You don't recreate angels. Angels can't have angels. They are a company. There's a fixed number of angels. Jesus didn't come in the form of an angel to save angels. He came in the form of, of a human being to save the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve and the seed of Abraham, those that would believe. He came to pull us out of that hell hole. There are angels that have fallen. We don't know how many there are, but we know that that's where demons and that's where Satan's kingdom is now, the fallen angels. There's a, there's a verse in Revelation chapter 13 that says that the dragon, the serpent, his tail swept away one-third of the hosts of heaven, the stars of heaven. And that's where you get that there are two-thirds in heaven and there's one-third on in Satan's kingdom of angels. But that's just assumption. So here are these shepherds hanging out, doing what they're supposed to do. And suddenly there's a messenger. And it says, I love this. This messenger says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There was glory all around them. There was a glow of God. There was the honor of God. There was the magnificence of God. There was heaven's vibration all over this being. And here they are sitting around probably a campfire looking up at the stars. And all of a sudden, boom, somebody just shows up from the invisible. Don't you love God? There is so much more than you and I can see, kids. It is all around us. It is all over us. Peter says that they long, the angels long to look into the, to the words of liberty and the words of revelation in the gospel because they don't understand it. They have seen the king and they lived with the king and they were created for the king and to see the king now become human and be born from the womb of a virgin into a stable was an amazing thing to them. And he says to them, then the angel of the Lord said to them in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 10, don't be afraid. It's an interesting thing that he said, don't be afraid to marry when she was given the message that she was going to have the Messiah. The angel said, hey, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. The angel Gabriel came in a dream to, to Joseph, and he said, Joseph, don't be afraid to marry Mary. Even though she's pregnant and you think she's betrayed you, fear not. Don't be afraid. That angel came to the shepherds, and the first thing out of his mouth is, fear not. So the first thing out of the mouth of that angel to me in 2012, in this economy, in this climate, in this culture, in the craziness of this world, is don't be afraid about anything. Fear not. Trust in God. Things may look bad, but God is good. And God can take the most difficult circumstance in your life and turn it around. There's a, a saying, and it was actually, it was written on the maps of the old world. They were called map makers, or let me read this to you. Most people are afraid of the unknown. You see an angel, I see an angel, we're going to be afraid. We've never seen it before. We're, it's going to scare us. Most people are afraid of the unknown. What you don't know is going to happen in your future or in your life, you are going to fear. That's the old nature default system, fear. It rules us. And God's changing that system from fear to faith. 
He has not called us to live in fear. He's called us to live by faith. In that new creation reality, when we've been translated out of darkness into God's kingdom, God has given us a whole new atmosphere to live in. But let me just read this to you about map makers because I think this is interesting. Most people are afraid of the unknown. Those things we have never seen or experienced can seem overwhelming. On the old maps, back before the world was understood in modern times, cartographers, map makers would put down what they knew, but at the edges of the map beyond which they had no knowledge or understanding, they would often write, beyond here, there be dragons. That was on the old world maps. Beyond here, there be dragons. Beyond the realm of what we know and see, there be dragons. There be evil. There be the unknown. There be Satan's kingdom, the dragon, Lucifer, the serpent. And the angel comes and he says, fear not. You don't have to be afraid of dragons. You don't have to be afraid of what you don't know. You don't have to be afraid of the unseen. You don't have to be afraid of Satan's kingdom and what Satan can do or can't do to you. You don't have to be afraid of the spirit of death and the angel of death. You don't have to fear anything any longer. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Because why? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, a defender, the one that's going to swallow up death and hell, the one that's going to defeat everything that has ever taken us out, the one that's going to restore us, our kinsman redeemer, who has our blood, who is our near relative, who is bone of our bone. He's a baby in a manger, and I bring you tidings of great joy. You don't have to ever be afraid again. I love this quote from a, a writer that I enjoy. Her name is Ann Dillard, and she says this, On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with her chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. Crash helmets, life preservers. The waking God may draw us out to a place where we can never return. A place in faith where the timid and the cowardly don't go. Where those that are cautiously, cautiously religious don't want to even step foot. And God says, I want you out of that place. I want you to understand that I am the God of heaven and earth. I have made you. I have made this planet. I am doing something in your life. And don't you ever be afraid again. Fear not sons and daughters of the Most High God. That's part one. Okay. <laughs> Number two, what would the angel say? Well, I believe point two is listen to God's good news. Listen to God's good news because we listen to everything else. God's gift is here. And this is what he said in Luke 2.10. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold... I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This angel says to them, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Listen to God's good news. Church in our world, there are voices speaking and screaming all the time. Voices and choices are coming at us every which direction. There is the voice of the world that I listen to. There is the voice of the demonic that I can hear. When Satan whispers in my ear and tells me things that will condemn me and intimidate me and try to get me off of my faith. There's the voice of my spirit, my conscience, which speaks to me. 
There's the voice of my flesh, my appetites that want to constantly dictate to me what I'm supposed to do and rule over me. And there's the voice of my soul, my intellect, that listens and sifts through all of these voices to make the choices that God wants me to make. And God says, I need you to shut everything down and listen to me. Because the words that I'm speaking to you, they are good tidings, good news. My word will bring you good news. My word will cause you to live your lives like you never dreamed you could live them. But you're going to have to shut down the voices and you're going to have to open up your hearts and you're going to have to open the book and you're going to have to get disciplined and be very selective in the hearing that you hear because there are voices and choices coming at us in every direction. I don't know about you, but what happened in Connecticut this week, this past week, was horrific. Horrific. But that's all we hear. We either hear that or we hear how we're going off the fiscal cliff. Or we hear this. Or we hear that. Or we hear this evil that's coming. Or this fear that could possibly be taking us out. Constantly, you and I are saturated with the negative and the horrific and the horrible. Like no other generation has ever been saturated, you and I are. It's online, it's on our phones, it's in our televisions, it's on our computers, it's on the airwaves, it's on television, it's in the movies. There isn't anywhere you can go where you are not getting symbols and images and words that are out to take you out. You are a generation that is bombarded and you are saturated with darkness. And God says, children, understand. Understand who you are. Understand you have the power to shut down the voices. You have the power to hear my voice. For my sheep hear my voice and the voice of a stranger. They will not follow, Jesus said in John the 10th chapter. You are wired by God to hear his voice. You are wired by God to live in faith and not fear. You are wired by God to turn your head like Emma did. And I told this story two Sundays ago when I was in ICU because Emma had to be in ICU for about seven days. She's fine now. She's healed and she's fine. But there was this little baby, six pounds, so weak and so defenseless in this little bitty, little bitty cubby getting oxygen. And her daddy, my son, comes into her and I, I was allowed to go. I had to scrub down. I was in a garment. And there was, there was Emma. And he put his hand on her back. And he spoke. And that little, that brand new baby, hours old, lifted herself up. And she turned. And she listened to the voice of her father. Because she was wired in the womb to hear his voice. There was something in the voice of her father that brought peace and comfort to her. In that scary situation, brand new infant. How much more are you wired? to hear the voice and the good news of your heavenly father that wants to speak to you every day. When Satan says you're going to fail, when Satan says that you're not going to make it, when Satan says there's no change, there'll never be any change, when Satan says this and when the devil says that and the world with all of its intellect begins to yeah, 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 ram, ram, ram it down our throats, God says stop the noise. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which are for all people, not a select a few, but the entire planet is given this incredible gift of good news. But how many will listen? And how much will we select to hear? So I believe the angels would say to us this Christmas, listen to the good news. Turn off the bad. God has an incredible destiny and an incredible future for every one of us. And failure is not a part of it. He's not called me to fail. He's called me to succeed. Now, there will be setbacks, but they're not failures. Let me read this to you. I've read it before, but I think I'm going to read it. This is the atmosphere he's called us to live in and to hear. I'm inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. This is not my native air, but in faith and confidence, I breathe freely. These are my native air. A John Hopkins University doctor says, we don't know why it is that warriors die sooner than non-warriors. But it's a fact. 
But I, who am simple of mind, think I know. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain, cell, and soul for faith and not for fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against reality. And God says faith comes by hearing the word of God. And for us to begin to grow up and to get strong and to breathe the air of faith, we're going to have to listen to the word of God. We're going to have to hear the good news when all the bad news wants to come against us. Rob our faith. Rob our hope. Rob our plans. Rob, rob our destiny. When you're believing God for that marriage and it gets worse and you hear the voices of darkness screaming into you that it's never going to change. It's never, ever going to change. When you get fired from that job and there's no jobs and you listen to the news and there's no job. San Bernardino has gone bankrupt and there's not this and there's not that. And it's a city of entitlement. When you hear those things, when you hear about your real estate and when you hear all these things, you know what? God says, step back and look up and shut the noise and listen to the good news of what I say can be because I'm the God of the impossible and what is impossible with man is possible with God because the virgin shall conceive and bring forth and his name is Jesus your Savior and right now shepherds he's in Bethlehem and you can go take a look at the gift I've given you of salvation and deliverance number three so number one let's just quickly review don't be afraid number two listen to God's good news turn off the bad number three here we go you ready Got a few minutes left. From the mess comes the message. Out of the mess of our lives comes the message of God. Let me put it another way. God's signs come from suffering. God's signs come from suffering. Now, here's the deal. The angels told the shepherds some very specific things. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7... It says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So we know that there wasn't any room for them in the inn. We know that Mary and Joseph had to go to a lambing cave, that they had to go where there was stock and livestock. And the only thing in that problem, that cave, that's what it was, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a wood manger, it wasn't a wood structure. We know that in that lambing cave, there was a wooden structure, a manger, that they made as a bed for the king of the universe. Now, that looks like a very negative scenario. That would not be where you and I would choose to bring forth our firstborn. Emma was in ICU, and we had to scrub for three minutes before we could even get near her with all kinds of antiseptic. It was a sterile environment because of the germs. There was no less germs in that lambing cave than there was today in the 21st century. It is not a place where a woman who's just bringing forth her firstborn and her husband would want to place their brand new born infant. But that's where it had to be. Now here's my point. In the mess is the message. Because here's what happens. When the angels came to the shepherds, in verse 12 of chapter 2, it says, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. God used that negative situation to be a sign to point the way to the baby they needed to see. Now think about this. How many newborn babies do you think were in Bethlehem? We don't know. If there would have been one at the inn... There could have been five new babies born within that week, right? He could have said, she's born at the inn, he's born at the inn, he's in Simeon's Inn, and just go down this street, turn left, they're on the top floor in that room. But how many babies could there have been? Are you with me? How many babies do you think there were in Bethlehem wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger? How many? There was one. This shall be a sign to you. Now, the angel is giving them directions to point the way to the Messiah. They've got to go find this baby in the middle of the night. And this baby is where nobody else is. 
He's in the unexpected place. He's in the mess. Who puts a newborn baby in a manger? And yet that mess was the very sign and message that they needed to identify God. Now, what is that saying to you and I? That in the very things we hate, in the very things that don't make any sense, in the very things and the interruptions, in the things of our lives that we say, why, God, you could have done it this way, it didn't have to go that way. In the very things that we don't understand, in the threads and the tapestry of our lives, when we look at our lives and say, why did this have to happen? In that tapestry and in that thread is the very message of God from the mess that you and I seem to be in. Because God takes our messes and he makes them our messages. Now listen. You've been divorced. You've been brokenhearted. Maybe it should have never happened. But it did. You can't go back and remake it. You can't go back 10 years and redo things. That's gone. But in that mess, there is a sign and a message in your life that God brings me through. And there is life after divorce. And if I walk with God and I stay with God, God can change my life. He can heal my kids. He can change my family. And there can be an abundant, wonderful life, even in the midst of all of this mess. I know because you're looking at a woman that experienced that. You're looking at a man as your pastor that was divorced three times before he was 25. We were messes. That's why we can pastor this church, and that's why we can preach this message to you. Our family is not a perfect family. Our children were not perfect children. We have stepchildren. We had children that don't like us, children that were estranged from us, children that went off into sin, and today they are all serving God. Why? Because out of the mess came the message that God uses that. Even though he didn't bring it, it has value in the kingdom of God if we will do things the right way. Now, here's the catch. Now, this you've got to listen. You've got to listen to this. If you wander right now, you're going to miss this. Because it's a trite saying to say the mess is in the message. The, mess, the message is in the mess. That can be a trite Christianity saying. That can be a cute little saying that we remember. But that's not what I want to deliver tonight. I'm talking about crash helmets and I'm talking about life jackets and this God that is incredible that knows exactly what is going on, understands that there's a manger for us to lay a baby in, but there's a reason for that manger, and we need to understand that in that unpleasant suffering, there's going to come something out of it that will be a signpost to somebody else that will get them to Jesus. Now, this is what Amy Carmichael said. And Amy Carmichael was a missionary to India in the 1800s. She was a young woman when she was 24 years old, a beautiful young woman from Ireland. She went to Japan. She failed miserably, and then she went off to India because she wasn't going to quit the mission field. And there, Amy was the very first missionary that began to rescue young girls and young boys from sexual slavery in the Hindu temples. Amy is a famous missionary, a famous writer. Amy, when she was 56, fell in India, and she broke something, and it never healed, and she was bedridden from that time on. And out of that suffering that she had came these amazing books that she wrote that changed my life and could change yours if you'd read them. She may never have written those books if she wasn't in the bed. Now, God's the healer, and God can heal us. But when things happen that we don't get, there will be kingdom purpose out of it if we listen to what Amy says. And this is what she writes. Nothing anyone can do to us can injure us unless we submit to a wrong reaction. Nothing anyone can do to us can injure us unless we submit to a wrong reaction. The eternal essence of a thing, a situation, or a circumstance is not in the thing itself, but in our reaction to it. It is not what anyone does to us that injures us, but it is the way we take it, the spirit in which we react. Only our reaction can bless or burn. We may not control what other people do to us, but by God's grace, we can control our response. We can control our response. And in the evil that comes at us, 
if we will grow up and mature in this and understand that in the suffering, there will be the purposes of God. And in our reaction to what is happening, God's glory will be seen and God's plans and purposes will be done. And that suffering and that adversity will only make us better and stronger. And in the adversity, there will be a signpost to take others to the kingdom of God and to the glory of Jesus Christ, just like that manger. I'm just about done. Number four, the last one, and this one we're just going to make a mention of and we're going to close. The angel said, I bring you tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was a host in the heavens praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill to men. I love that message, peace on earth and goodwill to men, but that's not point four. Because after this, it says in verse 15 of Luke chapter 2, and so it was when the angels had gone away into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. In Luke chapter 2, 16 in the Message Bible, it says they left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And the number four thing that the angels would teach me and the message from the angels would be run to do what God says. Run to do it. Run. Make haste. Put your effort into it. Put your backs into it. Put your hand to the plow. When you've heard the message of God, when God has spoken, don't sit back and wait and be timid and cowardly. Don't wonder if this is God. No, be absolutely people that are not afraid to go past the point of no return like the Rahabs and the Abrahams and the Davids and the heroes of faith and say, if God said it, I believe it, I'm going to live for it, and we're running to do it. And don't look back. Don't look to your right. Don't look to your left. But run to do what the word of God has been spoken and says to you because when you do, you're going to find what you're looking for. You're going to find the destiny of God. You're going to find the will of God. And just like those shepherds, found that baby lying in a manger because they made haste and they spoke it all through Bethlehem. And Mary heard those words and she pondered them and she hid them in her heart. It encouraged her heart because she didn't know that she would be soon getting back on that donkey and going to Egypt to escape a massacre. The massacre of innocence which we have heard on the news over that school is a quote out of Isaiah is a quote out of Micah, Rachel is weeping for her children, for she cannot be comforted. Because Herod came and slaughtered every child that was a male under the age of two. She carried those words with her because they ran to do the will of God. Rock Church, those that are listening by internet tonight, wherever you belong, whatever house God has sealed and set you into, run to do the will of God. This 2013 that's coming up, these are the greatest days ahead of us. No matter what this world is doing, how dark it gets, no matter how crazy it may seem, Daniel said in the last days that there will be great exploits and those who know their God will do great things. Knowledge will increase in the earth. People will run to and fro. And there will be those who will do great things because they know their God. God says, run, children. 2013 is not a time to sit back timidly and cowardly, wondering, riding the fence. It's a time to get up, get out, get going. Tell the good news into the highways and byways. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to our lives and to those that God has called us to. For God is on the throne. The Son is resurrected at the right hand of the Father. He is not a baby in a manger. He is the King of glory. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He stands on our behalf. He prays for us. And he has set an assignment on the earth for this generation to rise up and declare his works to the next all across this world. Did you get something out of tonight? Listen. Don't be afraid, church. Listen to the good news. Remember, God's message is in the mess you don't understand. 
and run to do what God told you to do. Yeah. Amen. But tonight, just before we leave, it's only 10 after 8. Wow, that's a miracle. We've got just a few more minutes, and I want to just speak to you for a second because I have a responsibility. One day, I'm going to stand before the throne of God, and I'll be at the judgment seat of Jesus, my King. And my works are going to pass through his flames of love. And I'll be responsible for what I did tonight. And so I want to make sure that I am clear and I present the gospel to you in a very clear way and an opportunity because God brought you here by divine appointment and by divine design tonight. And I need to ask you a question that's up close and personal and maybe you don't want to answer it or think about it, but I don't care. I'm too old to care what you think now. But let me ask you this. Life is fragile and life is short. If you were to walk out those doors tonight and tonight were to be the last night of your earth time, if you were to die, where would you open your eyes? Where would you spend eternity? Would you spend eternity in heaven, in God's heaven, or someplace else? Hell. And maybe you're saying, I don't know. I think I'm going to God's heaven. I'm a good person. Good people go to God's heaven. I hope I'm going to heaven. Or maybe you're saying, you know what, I don't really know. And I'm not sure I believe in hell. So let me address some of those thoughts. First of all, God says there's only one way to his heaven. Only one. It's his way. Not our way. Not the wisdom of this world or the voices of all the world religions or the opinions of the intellectual. There's only one way to God's heaven. And God said, you must be born again. God did not say, if you are a good person... You're going to my heaven. Because God said, my goodness and your goodness, our attempt at behaving ourselves is like a filthy rag in comparison to his. The measuring stick for goodness is not each other. The measuring stick and the plumb line for goodness is God himself. And God knew that you and I could never measure up to that standard of perfection. It's impossible. For all have sinned. All have missed the mark. All have messed up and come short of the goodness of God. We cannot work our way to heaven. We cannot behave our way to heaven. And you know, you can't believe your way to heaven. Because if I asked you, do you believe in Jesus and that's why you're going to heaven? And you say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm not Muslim. I'm not Buddhist. I'm not Jewish. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm celebrating Christmas. I believe in Jesus. Well, most of America believes in Jesus. It's not what you believe in your head, it's what you've done in your heart. Because this, the devil believes that Jesus is the Son of God and he's not going to heaven. This is not about an intellectual or mental assent. This is about a reaction and a relationship that you and I have made with the living God. And God says, there's only one way to my heaven, and that is you must be born again. Born again, what does that mean? Well, Jesus explained it to a man named Nicodemus who was a rabbi in Jerusalem, who was a famous celebrity rabbi. Nicodemus was a brilliant man, and he came to Jesus, and he asked Jesus the question I asked you. How do I get to heaven? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, I can't even swallow that. I'm an old man. I can't, be, I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, Nicodemus... You're a teacher of the law, and you don't understand this. Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. You are a spirit being. You are in a flesh body. You are body, soul, and spirit. God is a spirit. It's in the invisible world, and your spirit and my spirit has been disconnected and has died. That's what death is, is a separation from God because of something called sin. And I need my spirit to be born again. Now, I already explained that God has made it very clear that we can't behave our way into heaven. We can't be good enough for heaven. We can't go to enough church services and do enough brownie points over the traditions of men. We can't do that. There's only one way. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, how does that happen? And Jesus said, here's how it happens, Nicodemus. I'm going to a cross. I'm going to be lifted up on that cross. And Nicodemus, I'm going to draw men to me. 
I am qualified to be that kinsman redeemer. I am all God and I am all man and I'm going to lay my life down on that cross and I will be the sacrifice for you and the entire population of humanity. And if you will look to that cross and you will surrender your life and believe I am who I said I am, I will come in, I will take your life, and I'll cause you to be born again, and I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness, and I'll bring you to the Father. Now, it's been a mockery, and America has mocked Christianity. We need crash helmets and life preservers because he is not a God to be trifled with. This is real. It's either real or it's not. He's either all God and all man, or this is a hoax. And it's not a hoax. He was raised from the dead. He is the living, breathing son of God, the last Adam, the one that came in flesh to pay the price for sin that I could never pay and that you could never pay. And he has already done all he's going to do, all he needs to do. He has laid his life down. He had the power to pick it back up. He took on the sin of my life and your life. But until I receive that gift and say, I believe, I surrender, you are the Son of God. I need a Savior, and I'm asking you to take my life. At that moment in time, he will take your heart and your life. He will come in and change you from the inside out. Because you, my darlings, cannot. You can't fix you. You can't change you. Only God can. And he's done all he can do. But now it's up to us to receive the gift and say yes to him. So if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, I'm speaking to you tonight, and you are here by divine appointment. If you've been running from God instead of to God, you don't trust yourself, you know you're a screw-up, you know you're a rascal, you know that you're not trustworthy and you believe this, but you know you can't live it. I'm talking to you because you cannot change you, but he can. If you've been a good person, you've done your best to live a good moral life, I'm speaking to you because our morality and our good choices don't get us to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ, surrendering our heart to him, receiving the sacrifice that he paid for us, letting him take us to the Father. You must be born again, surrendering our lives to him. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. You've been a rascal, I'm so talking to you. There's a lot of rascals in here, including this old pastor. If you've backslidden, you don't trust yourself. I've done this before, and here I am again. Well, then God brought you here. He doesn't wear out. He doesn't throw you out. He doesn't say, oh, boy, there they are again. No, he says, come home. It's time to get right with me. Trust me and let's do this. So I'm going to do something that may make you uncomfortable, but I'm going to ask with heads up and eyes open. I'm going to count to three. I'm just going to bang on this pulpit like this. Bang. That was pretty loud. I'm going to ask you just to raise your hands at the same time because we believe this. The Bible says if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. We believe that it's no shame to say yes to Jesus Christ. This is what we were made for. He came for us. And it's a privilege to say yes. And if you can't say yes in this safe sanctuary, how can you walk out there and live for Jesus Christ in a hostile world? So all over this auditorium with heads up and eyes open. If you've been not served God and you need to get right with God tonight, I'm speaking to you. You've been a rascal, I'm talking to you. You've backslidden, I'm talking to you. You've been a good person, but you've never given your heart and your life to him, I'm talking to you. Are you ready all over this auditorium? Let's get right with God tonight. I'm going to count to three, and then we're just going to get our hands up together. Let's do it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. There's one hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Keep them high. Let me see them. Wave them at me. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. It's about 12 hands, 15 hands going up. I see that hand, I see that hand. This is what we're going to do. We're going to sing this song and we're going to stand and we're going to sing this song. If you raised your hand or if you didn't and you know you should have, I'm going to ask you to brought, bring what you brought to church with you. Gather it up in your arms. Slip out of the aisles. Meet me right here at this altar. Let's get right with God tonight on this Christmas 2012. In this season, God's brought you here to receive the greatest gift 
of your entire eternity, the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus Christ. If you didn't raise your hand, just come down with everybody else. Let's get right with God tonight and come quickly. Like the shepherds came in haste, come quickly to do what God has instructed you to do. Quickly come, quickly come. Quickly come, quickly come. It's not too late, just come down. Quickly come, they're still coming. Some of you are wondering, is that me? Yes, it's you. Get out of your seat, grab your stuff, get down here and get right with God. He brought you here to save you. He died for you. He paid the highest price for you. Heaven is waiting for you, but you have to come and receive the gift of salvation and the gift of life. They're still coming, they're still coming, they're still coming. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Come quickly. This is a precious sight. Your angels were assigned to you the day you were born. They're called guardian angels, and Jesus said they see the Father's face. And it says in the Word of God in the New Testament that they, there, there is great joy in heaven when one turns from sin. One. So. My attempt at dancing. They're dancing. They're having a party. So smile at me. You're not going to a funeral. You're coming to life. He's not mad at you. He loves you. Have you been screw-ups? Yeah, but guess what? That's all subject to change. He came for the screw-ups. He came for the dirty shepherds. He came for the women that were throwaways. He came for all of us, all people. So this is Pastor Dave, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to ask you in just a moment. This is our wonderful Pastor Dave, and we're going to take you into our new believers room, and we're going to privately pray with you there. We're going to tell you three things. Number one, my husband's written a great little book called Now What? I'm not sure if that's what it's called, but that'd be a great title. <laughs> what is that book called? Welcome to Your Destiny. That's even better, yeah. Oh. And maybe now what is it so good, is it? That's why he wrote it and I didn't. Okay. We're going to give you that book. It's real easy reading. We need you to read it. Now, when we had our babies, we didn't leave them in the hospital. I actually brought them home, fed them, loved them, and took care of them. Right? So did you. So you're brand new in the Lord. We're not going to just throw you out there and say, okay, you're saved. Now off you go. No. We want to help you grow strong in the Lord and grow up in the Lord. You're not joining a church. You're saying yes to Jesus. But we have here at this church a program. We give friends away here. It's called a spiritual personal trainer. And this person, if you're a woman, it'll be a woman. If you're a guy, it'll be a guy. She'll, she or he will meet you. They'll tell you five things in five weeks. You can call them if you got questions, if you have messed up. Now, when I first got saved, I messed up so bad. I thought, oh, my gosh, now I'm unsaved again. And I would call this person, and she would say, no, you're saved. You just screwed up. Let's pray. Okay? So just understand that you're new in the Lord, and things are going to happen. But he's not going to let go of you. He is not going to let go of you. You belong to him. So we're going to give you that book. We're going to give you a spiritual personal trainer if you want one. So, okay, it's totally up to you. And then we're going to send you off tonight. And may this be the most glorious Christmas you've ever had. So if you'll just make a left turn. This is Pastor Dave. And join him.